Good day chaps. So today's video carries on our walk around the ranges. In the last video we looked at some of the oldest chieftains in the world and the rare contentious drop rig. But today we have what is arguably my three favourite vehicles on these ranges. Not only are the machines amazing, but their exact location is breathtaking. After travelling towards the coast, dodging packs of delinquent sheep, we set off towards the sea cliffs, and there, highlighted against the edge of the cliffs, were our next trio of tanks, and so we began to head up. The first of these machines is this excellent FV-214 Conqueror tank, the last of the Conquerors at Kakubri. Although once there were many more on these ranges, now, sadly, they've all been chopped up by this one. What's even more special is she was once a Carnarvon tank. Those hulls fitted with the Centurion turret before they were converted over. Today, she sits in the long grass, her track curled up to the front and her turret facing inland. Despite the years of being shot at, she is remarkably intact. And although the interior has long gone, her hull and turret are more or less in one piece. A few shots to the side have broken up her suspension, but the saltwater corrosion has contributed far more than shot or shell. On the back of her turret, the ESE, English Steel Corporation stamp, is clearly visible from when she was first cast. Lower down, a distinct crack has formed where her turret ring bulge is located, from what appears to be an old shot that has struck at a poor angle, splitting the metal. And while the front of the armour, some 260 millimetres of it by line of sight is intact, many of the fittings and extras have long come loose over the years. Progressing down the side, there is a Hesh practice round still wedged into the rear sprocket, the shell body itself slowly crumbling away into flakes. The sprocket seems relatively intact still, and the tract is still attached, but this is just a reminder that this once was a live range and a real target. A look down the side shows more damage. The return rollers are all badly hit and just the holes indicate where various fittings were once found, while assorted damage types can be seen from hesh strikes and practice round dents, and the telltale burned logs in the back indicate she may well have once been used as a thermal target. Around the back it's still mostly intact. Although all the fittings have long gone, you can still make out some of the green paint of her original colours. Many of her welds are still intact and show little splitting or cracking, despite the hits taken, a testament to her sturdy build. On the other side, the story is a lot better. The tracks are entirely intact and the return rollers are present, and the tracks have gone almost purple-black in colour with rust, but not in the same way as the salt-corroded stuff. It might be the manganese metal type, I don't know, but they are very distinct, and some of the original tin work is present on the sides including refilling points and the like. The turret is more or less intact, although the gun and mounting are missing, and the interior is devoid of many bits. The smoke pots are still there on one side, although missing on the other, which I later found in the long grass. There is a distinct serial number on the hull bulge, C13HS, which is unknown to myself, and I'll have to take a look-see to find out the meaning of this bit. The turret opening shows the mounting points for the original heavy mantlet, and on one side we can see the hesh damage that was visible earlier, having left a near perfect scab to one side, which would have wrecked the gun if it was ever fitted. After taking a few measurements and poking around the vehicle for a bit more, it was time to take a lunch break. Being able to relax on these cliff tops are honestly one of my favourite places on this planet. If you're like me and the idea of sitting in two square foot of sand on a beach packed with 10,000 tourists and screaming kids sounds like hell, then this is the opposite. It's the very definition of remote and people free. The only real sound is the wind which whips up the cliffs and feels amazing. As although the weather was now in its high 30s, the chill sea breeze would cool you down at the same time, which felt fantastic. Sitting there in the swaying grass, you can't help but be amazed by the amount of wildlife around you. And when it comes to plants, there's more diversity here than a Netflix reboot. The Commandant did point out while this may be true in summer, come winter, when the rain and ice was coming in sideways, scouring off your face, it lost some of its charm. But in that moment, 
in the sun, in the grass, with the tank wrecks around, it truly was perfect. Alas, all great things come to an end, and with the phone charged back up, it was off to work. Although this was no bad thing, as the next wreck was only about 10 metres away. It's a Sherman 105, and one that's seen better days. These vehicles are remarkably rare in the UK at best, with only a limited number used for testing and training under the Sherman name 1BY. This vehicle has taken a right duffing over, and now the turret hangs on by a thread and will likely collapse in the next good storm. Having broken loose of its mountings, and the interior is nearly petrified with corrosion. The sides show extensive damage, and these rounds were probably post-war APDS, maybe 17 or 20 pounder, as they have not passed out of the other side. The suspension on one side is utterly destroyed and beyond repair. There are large sections of track scattered around in the long grass, and the remains of wheels, interior parts, ammunition boxes and so on. The front and rear sprocket could not be located, so whether looted in the past or they've simply rolled off down the hill remains to be seen. The sea salt has worked over the suspension points to a new level, and now even touching them causes them to crumble, and to try and tow this vehicle would result in it simply falling apart. The rear of the Sherman isn't much better. It's been utterly decimated by shot and hash rounds. The large concave dent may even be a Malkara strike, as a very similar pattern can be seen on vehicles that were tested out in Libya. Another vehicle in this range may have also taken Malkara hits as well. The hull is folded in and the tracks are shredded, and the interior utterly ruined. Looking inside the engine bay, it seems that the engine, or parts of it, were once still fitted, although now most of it is just tank kibbles. And while I'm quite aware that some tank restoration sites can work wonders, I think this engine is probably beyond even their capability to salvage. The interior of the turret is no better. The steel is rotten through, and the whole thing wobbles in the wind. The corrosion around the breech and turret ring has left the steel so weak that you could, with a little effort, just snap a two-inch thick plate of it with your hands. The gun is intact, well, it's a solid block of rust, but you can make out where most of it was. But I decided that with this turret wobbling back and forth and my head stuck under it, to extract myself before I earned myself a new Darwin Award. The outside hull isn't too bad on the other side. The front glass is intact and hasn't been eaten away yet, and if one looks closely you can see where a round is deflected off the plate at an extreme angle, and on the side you can just make out some serial numbers, but I can't quite figure out what it is. If you think you know, let me know in the comments below. I think the numbers 0 and 8 are visible. Facing out to sea, the tin work along the guards has been nibbled away at, and the track is mostly intact on the side, and some of the HVSS suspension points are still in a slightly better condition. After collecting some serial numbers from various parts of people, well, at least the ones I could see on the outside, as there was precisely zero chance of me climbing on top of it, I measured a few gubbins for my own use, and I left the Sherman in its piece. This vehicle is arguably the oldest machine now left on these ranges, and while Shermans are becoming increasingly valuable, any attempt to move this one would probably end in failure, as it just shook itself apart. I didn't stop too long to ponder this though, as my next tank was just 20 metres away, and this, like so much more on the range, is also very rare. It's an ETT, or evasive target tank, which is a modification in which a tank is up-armoured and any weak spot sealed off, and then either used for manned or unmanned driving while practice rounds and small arms are fired at them. The most famous of these were the Centurion ones, of which one survives at Bovington. At least three of these vehicles were known to have been made. This one at Kukubri, another that was on the Otterburn Ranges in a very sorry state, and a third which has now been converted back to a boring old regular tank in a private collection. At first glance from the front, you can see there are quite a few changes. The gun barrel has been welded shut and there are protective plates added to the hull top and down the sides. Originally the machine gun port would have also had a blanking plate fitted over the front, but this is now missing. The Comet ETT would likely have only been designed for small arms and machine gun strikes or similar 
rather than their heavier centurions which had missiles fired at them. To help, a collar was placed around the neck of the vehicle, around 10 millimetres thick, yet this one has clearly been struck with bigger rounds once her roll was over, including what appears to be 30 millimetre rounds which had passed through, and possibly a 105 millimetre exit wound. The sides are mostly intact, although the track is broken, and the front idler is gone, as well as one return roller. Four of the five wheels are in fairly good nick, despite the grass growing between them, and the rear engine bay is open, exposed to the elements. The pagoda is missing, although whether it's been taken as a souvenir or not, I don't know, as most of the vehicles on the range are missing those rear covers. Coming around the back end, you can see the deck plates are just about holding on there, and there's some damage to one side. The distinct fishtails are missing, and wild brambles are starting to colonise the wreck. A noticeable exit wound on the back of the turret is in fact two shots that slightly overlap each other, and overstress the metal causing it to shard out. On the other side there's more brambles and the suspension is mostly shot away. The rear wheels are still there and the track is broken up. The two holes from the previous penetrating shot are visible, so close together they almost appear to be one strike. Once we'd taken our photos and made notes and so on, we began to head up the hill ready for the next part of our journey. In the next and probably final video, We'll find a new unknown comet and take photos, while the Commandant gets mugged by a bunch of local cows. We'll come across a shredded tank ripped apart by machine gun fire, and stumble over the remain of armoured cars, Churchills, and a half-eaten comet, before finally ending up at a formerly top-secret railgun site. But I hope you enjoy these range walks, and I hope I can get more to you in the future. But until that time, toodle-pip.